I would like to welcome all of you here this evening to the University of St. Thomas. My name is Father Joseph Pilsner. I'm the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences here at the University. If you've come to um, other presentations here, you know that Dr. Paul Hahn has been acting as your Master of Ceremonies, but since he's the speaker tonight, it was rather awkward for him to introduce himself. <coughs> so he called on me to step in. Dr. Hahn um, has been here at the University of St. Thomas for a number of years. He did his bachelor's and master's degree in English at Emporia State University in Emporia, Kansas. He taught English at Northern Illinois University, took a master's degree in theology at the Aquinas Institute of Theology, which was a Dominican House of Studies at the time in Dubuque, Iowa. He then became a professional writer for the five bishops of Wisconsin, that is the Wisconsin Catholic Conference, and for a while um, put out their official documents. He then went on and did a doctorate in theology at Marquette University. Since then, he has taught at eight institutions of higher learning, including two seminaries. Currently, Dr. Hahn serves as the chairman of the theology department here at the University of St. Thomas. Um, Dr. Hahn teaches mostly scripture courses, but sometimes uh, moonlights on the systematic side, um, sometimes uh, teaching the Christian anthropology course, which is um, certainly important, called Grace and the Human Condition, also teaches Eastern and Western world religions. Um, I can tell you, as someone who was recently in the theology department, he is a a wonderful colleague and a wonderful human being called by administrators uh, at the university as a senior uh, statesman of the university. Um, I um, am pleased and privileged to uh, introduce to you for this evening's topic on the uh, Liturgy of the Hours, uh, University of St. Thomas's own Dr. Paul Hahn. Good evening, everyone. Lucky for me, I did my master's degree in theology at a Dominican institution. <laughs> at least I'm not going to get any, any tomatoes tonight, I don't think. So. Well, our topic for the evening is the Divine Office, also known as Liturgy of the Hours. Actually, to be precise, the topic for the evening is the development of the Divine Office. What I'd like to do is trace the history of this uh, aspect of Roman Catholic liturgy. I suppose that the Divine Office ultimately has its roots in human nature and in the creation insofar as we live on a planet that uh, goes around the sun or uh, turns on its axis as it goes around the sun. And consequently, we experience morning and evening. It's, as Father Pilsen just mentioned, I teach world religions. I'm familiar with the fact that virtually all religions have morning prayers, and all religions have evening prayers. I think that's simply built into human nature as our uh, planet does its diurnal turn. Uh, also a remote uh, beginning of the divine office, not quite that remote, is Judaism. And I'd like to go back to um, the time of the temple. The first temple, which existed from 960, built by Solomon, until 587, and then a brief hiatus when that one was destroyed by the Babylonians, but it was rebuilt again in 518 and survived until 70 AD. According to the Mosaic law, priests at the temple were required to perform two sacrifices every day. The one sacrifice had to occur at dawn and the other sacrifice occurred toward evening. The sacrifice had to be a one-year-old male unblemished lamb in both instances. 
Now we know that these two sacrifices, morning and evening, were accompanied by prayers because we're told that. Unfortunately, the precise texts that were uh, accompanying the sacrifices have not come down to us. We also know that songs were sung in addition to prayers being said. When the Babylonians destroyed the first temple in 587 BC and led the leaders of Judaism from Jerusalem to the city of Babylon, where they there kept them in uh, capture, the Jewish leaders were no longer able to perform animal sacrifices. That had been the focus of their religion up to uh, the Babylonian exile in 587. Consequently, how were they still to worship God in this foreign land? Well, it's, we cannot be sure that synagogues originated in the Babylonian exile. What we can say for sure, though, is that synagogues arose in response to a need to praise God uh, without being able to join the community at the temple. In other words, as Jews became more widely dispersed, synagogues became extant. They may go back to the Babylonian exile, we're not quite sure, but a lot of scholars presume that. Now these services could not perform animal sacrifices. The Mosaic law says those are restricted to the temple. So what were synagogue services like? Well, basically, they had three parts to them. They had scripture readings. They had a homily. And they had prayers. The scripture readings, of course, would have included uh, readings from the book of Psalms and perhaps singing from the book of Psalms. Psalms is a unique book in the Old Testament because each of its 150 passages is simultaneously a prayer. It's also a song. There are numerous references to musical instruments and to melodies that various psalms are to be sung according to. But also, thirdly, uh, poems. Each is a poem. Consequently, the Book of Psalms should be thought of as a hymnal. It was the hymn book of the Second Temple. Some of the Psalms go back to the period of the First Temple. Not a lot do, but a few do. The majority, however, were written in those centuries after the Babylonian exile, 400s, 300s, 200s, maybe even 100s. The um, prayers that were said consisted of two prayers, the Shema, and according to the Mosaic law, this was a prayer that every adult male Jew had to say twice a day, morning and evening. The Shema is the very famous statement. It means listen. It's the Hebrew word for listen. It's the very famous statement from Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. In addition to the Shema, synagogue services also included a second, much considerably longer prayer, um, sometimes known as the Amidah, because people said it standing up. Amidah is Hebrew for standing. Um, sometimes known as the Tefillah, which simply means prayer. Uh, sometimes known as Shimone Ezra, which means the 18 benedictions. 
Now, these were not scriptural prayers. These were prayers that had been created by various rabbis over the years and had been found worthy of inclusion in this collection of 18 blessings or benedictions that were uh, recited at every synagogue service. What about times of prayer? Well, we know that synagogue services tended to be morning and evening. There are references, however, to other times of prayer in pre-Christian Judaism. Psalm 4 has traditionally been interpreted as an evening prayer. For example, Psalm 4, 4, and 8, when you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. The next psalm, Psalm 5, has traditionally been interpreted as a morning prayer. You'll recall Genesis chapter 1, there was evening, there was morning the first day. Jews start the day at sunset and end it the following sunset. Psalm 5 says, O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I plead my case to you and watch. I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in awe of you. Now, in addition to that pair of psalms, 4 and 5, which appear to have been one for the evening and one for the morning, we also have references to specific times of prayer. We're told that Judith prayed at the time of the evening sacrifice at the temple. She herself, however, was not in Jerusalem. She was at some distance. Daniel, we are told, prayed three times a day. Daniel 6.10 says, he continued to go to his house, which had windows in its upper room open toward Jerusalem, and to get down on his knees three times a day to pray to his God and praise him. Psalm 55 makes reference to three times per day of prayer. Uh, 5517 says, evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and he will hear my voice. Finally, we have evidence from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Apparently, the Essenes, the individuals who lived in the Qumran community and wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls in the first century BC, uh, they mentioned daily exercise of prayer in the morning and also about noon and also in the evening. You also have a reference to prayers during the night. So perhaps that was becoming uh, a practice not just in the heretical sect of the Essenes, but in um, Orthodox Judaism as well. Well, what about the early church? Jesus uh, loved and respected the temple. We also know that he attended synagogue services. I went through and I came up with 14 places in the Gospels where it says Jesus went to a synagogue. Um, he left that place and entered their synagogue. He came to his hometown and began to preach the people in their synagogue, etc., etc. So surely he would have been familiar with the regular synagogue services consisting primarily of scripture readings, psalms, and prayers. Um, he himself prayed at certain times. In the morning, well, this is Mark 135, in the morning while it was still dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. I think 
that example may have had some influence in the development of pre-dawn prayer in the divine office. Um, during those days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and he spent the night in prayer to God. Perhaps vigil has been influenced by that. Well, what about after Jesus? The early Christians certainly prayed frequently in imitation of their Lord, but we also know that they frequented the temple where they would have seen morning and evening services, and they also attended the synagogue services. Um, for example, Acts 9.20 says he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, referring to Paul. Now we know that synagogue services incorporated repetitive prayer, prayers that were repeated, as well as variable prayers. The uh, repeated prayers were the Shema and the 18 benedictions. In Acts, we find statements about daily prayers. For example, Acts 3.1. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. In Acts 10, you have another reference to this. Cornelius says, four days ago at this very hour, at 3 o'clock, I was praying in my house. Since he was a uh, convert to Judaism, he presumably would have chosen that time because it, it was becoming common in Jewish practice. There's also a reference to noon. Acts 10, 9, about noon the next day, Peter went up on the roof to pray. There's also a reference to midnight. In Acts 16, 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns. The Didache is probably the earliest, or at least one of the two earliest, Christian documents in existence outside the New Testament. It comes from perhaps 70 to 100 AD, and therefore it was written during the time of the New Testament documents. And in it, we have this statement. Recite the Lord's Prayer three times a day. Perhaps that's morning, noon, and evening, or morning, 3 o'clock, and evening. We're not sure. But you can see already, uh, before the close of the New Testament period, the church is starting to develop a schema of prayers. Now we move to the 200s, where we start to get considerably more evidence about a uh, developing liturgical practice of, of prayer. Tertullian uh, wrote a book, it's called De Oratione, on prayer, about 200 AD, and here's what he says. With regard to the time, I refer to those hours of community prayer which mark the main divisions of the day, namely the third, sixth, and ninth which you may find were in established use in the scriptures. Well, we've just looked at the scriptural evidence. I'm not quite sure we can find precisely those times, but he's on the right track. And he makes reference to the third, the sixth, and the ninth. He doesn't say so, but what he's referring to is hours. Um, there were no uh, timepieces such as we have on our wrists and in our pockets, which precisely divide uh, a 24-hour period into 24 hours, each with 60 minutes and each minute with 60 seconds. Back then, um, Roman Empire recognized 12 hours during the day, and it recognized 12 hours during the night. But of course, if it's winter time and the days have gotten short, 
then the 12 hours during the day are going to be few in minutes compared to in the summer when daytime is long and the night is short, and then you get the reverse situation. Um, I put a quotation concerning that on the bottom of the single-sided page, the one with the chart at the top. It's a quotation from uh, Daily Life in Ancient Rome. So how would they have determined uh, when these hours were? Well, they basically said when the sun is at the zenith, then it's noon. And when it's at a 45 degree angle, then it's what you and I would call 9 AM, but what they called the third hour. So the first hour would be when dawn has occurred. Three hours will take you to mid-morning, what you and I call nine. Three more hours will take you to noon. Three more hours, or what they would call the sixth hour, because you're now six hours from the first hour. Three more hours will take you to what we would call three o'clock, mid-afternoon, uh, the ninth hour. When these uh, hours became common as times for prayer in the early church, Latin terms were used. And those terms are tersa, sext, and nona. Tertullian also, in addition to referring to the hours of Tersa Sext and Nona, also in a work about the same time, 200 AD, called Ad Uxorum, he refers to another hour, rising, and this is a quote, rising in the night to pray. Now, he would have taken dawn and dusk for granted. Those were extremely well established, not only because of the temple and synagogue precedents, but also because we've got evidence prior to 200 that these were times in which the early Christians were praying. So if we add to morning and dusk, the three daytime hours, we're up to five. And if now we add this reference to rising in the night to pray, then we're up to six hours. Another writing from the 200s that has come down to us, it's attributed to Hippolytus, but is perhaps pseudonymous, is called the Apostolic Tradition. It dates from about 215 AD. And in it, you find seven hours. There's morning prayer. Hippolytus, I'll refer to him as, says, let every faithful man and woman, when they rise from sleep at dawn, pray to God. If there should be an instruction in the word, the God-fearing man should consider it a great loss if he does not go to the place in which they give instruction, and especially if he knows how to read. Here, uh, Hippolytus is not only saying, pray to God when you first wake up, when you, before you get up from bed or while you're making breakfast. He's, he's saying it's preferable to do a public prayer. If there's going to be a homily in addition to uh, prayers, be sure to go. And that would be at the local church, one would assume. He also says in another passage, let the deacons and presbyters assemble daily. They shall instruct those who are in the church. And after having also prayed, let each one go about his own business. Hippolytus re refers to Tersa, 9 o'clock AM. If you are in your own home, pray at the third hour and praise God. If you are elsewhere at that moment, pray in your own heart. Sext is also referred to, pray as well on the sixth hour, because when Christ was nailed to the wood of the cross, the daylight was suspended. He refers to Nona, three in the afternoon, 
Let there also be full prayer and praise at the ninth hour. And he refers to two nighttime prayers. Here's what he says about the first one. This is Apostolic Tradition 41. Pray also before retiring for the night. But at about midnight, rise and wash your hands with water and pray. And if you have a wife, both of you pray together. It is necessary to pray at this hour because the ancients who handed on the tradition to us have taught us that in this hour, all creation pauses for a brief moment to praise God. And at cock crow, likewise, rise and pray. You can see how the hours are multiplying, but they're also becoming more precisely determined. Cock crow, by the way, is not dawn. Uh, having grown up on a farm in Kansas, I'm quite well aware of this fact. <laughs> the rooster outside your window, whether it's a school day or not, is going to cackle uh, quite some time before dawn, when the very earliest bits of light are available. I put a second passage there on the single-sided page, which has the chart at the top. Um, which gives some kind of interesting information about the gradations of dawn and the gradations of dusk and so on, which are kind of relevant to determining times for uh, prayer prior to the establishment of precision in timekeeping. Okay, now, apostolic tradition refers to getting up at midnight and praying. It also, in addition to midnight and cock crow, it refers to something that it calls lucernarium. Well, lucernarium comes from the word for lamp. And so this would be the time of the lighting of the lamps. This would be in the evening when dusk is falling and you've reached that point where you better turn on your car lights or you're going to have an accident. About that time, he's saying, you should also um, have a liturgical celebration. Now, back then, around 200s, people would have gathered after their work days, the Christians would have gathered in somebody's home, more likely than not, and they would have shared a common meal, and they would have lit the lamps as darkness encroached upon them. We're told here um, that the blessing of light was done by a, a priest or deacon. There was responsorial psalmody. So we're starting to get this idea of antiphonal music. Nowadays, we don't really, in the Roman rite have any uh, trace of this lighting of the lamp ceremony that would have been done by the Christian community on a daily basis, except on Easter Vigil. And there we still have the lighting of the lamp. Goes all the way back to this period. Cyprian of Carthage, who wrote around 250, AD refers to morning, third, sixth, ninth, and sunset. We saw that the apostolic uh, um, tradition had referred to a prayer at midnight, which was distinct from cock crow. Um, some have thought that that's a reference to going to bed at midnight. At any rate, a new hour appears, and that's the hour of Compline. Compline comes from the Latin word for completion, the completion of the day. This is the prayer that you say, just as you do one when you first arise, so you do one when you retire for the night. Finally, another prayer period was inserted 
between morning prayer and Tirsa at 9 o'clock, and that's prime, which would have occurred at 6 a.m. when the sun has uh, fully risen. Consequently, by around 4.50, what we have is a pretty settled determination of what times of prayer are being recommended to the faithful. And that's the chart that I've presented for you here at the top of the single-sided page. If we skip the current names for the moment, we'll get back to that when we hit Vatican II. You can see uh, Latin names, early Latin names, Vigilia, Matutinum, Prima, Tertia, Sexta, Nona, Lucernarium, Completorium. Their etymology is vigilia, means wakefulness, or a vigil, a watch. Matutina, morning, prima first, tertia third, sexta sixth, nona ninth. Lucerna, lamp, prayer when lamps are lit. And complere, to fill or complete. Later Latin names, now we're talking 1200s, 1300s, 1400s. And I put the dates of earliest extant use there beside them, are matins, lauds, from laudare to praise, prima tersa sext nona, vespers, from the word vesper, which is evening, and compline. In Roman time, these hours would have been middle of the night, night watch, Cock crow, the first hour, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour, twelfth hour. Compline, when you go to bed. In our time, these would have been roughly equivalent to midnight, first light, sunrise, 6 a.m., depending on whether it's summer or winter, 6 to 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 12 a.m., 3 a.m., dusk, depending on whether it's summer or winter, sometime between 6 and 8. And bedtime, I put around 8 o'clock because I did find some evidence that they did not tend to stay up and watch late movies back then. <laughs> so now, how many hours have we got here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I thought there were seven canonical hours. Well, there was a tendency to think of lauds and matins as a single hour, because the, the second lauds began immediately as the first ended. And so um, that, that's where you get your seven traditional uh, canonical hours for the prayer. So what we have by, let's say, 400 is what when nowadays we refer to as the cathedral office. It was an office that was done in the cathedral. We do not yet have parish churches. Usually there's one big church a gathering um, for the Christians in a city. And it's at that building that these hours are said. It's at this point, however, oh, I, let me say something more about the um, cathedral office. We have a wonderful document that has come down to us written by a woman. She was a Roman noble woman from Spain. Her name was Egeria. And she apparently belonged to a community of sisters. And she kept a diary of a pilgrimage that she took to Jerusalem in order to uh, be able to relate to her sisters what she had seen. She, it was a three-year-long pilgrimage. Well, lucky for us, she records in detail 
what the daily services were like at the Church of the Sepulchre, Anastasis, the uh, Greek for uh, Church of the Resurrection. Now here's what she says. All the doors of the Anastasis are opened before cockcrow each day, and the ascetics and virgins come in, and also some laymen and women, at least those who are willing to wake at such an early hour, from then until daybreak, they join in singing the refrains to the hymns, psalms, and antiphons. There is a prayer between each of the hymns, since there are two or three priests and deacons each day by Rota, who are there with the ascetics and virgins, to say the prayers uh, between the hymns and antiphons. You'll notice the priests did not go if they could avoid it. It's, they split it up by rotation, and if it's your turn, you have to go do this. Now, we're starting to see the beginnings of an influence on the divine office that is not what we've seen thus far. Up to now, what we have seen is a developing rotation of prayers primarily aimed at the local congregation. It's you as a Christian in Antioch in 200 AD or in Alexandria in 200 AD, wherever you may be, you are expected to join, to go to the church for morning services, go to work, say a prayer during the day, either tersa sext or nona, Come back in the evening, join your community, and then go home. What Ageria is pointing out, though, is that here we've got primarily what she refers to as monatsontes and parthenai. Monatsontes, we're not quite sure. It's translated ascetics. Parthenai is virgins, so that would be sisters, consequently ascetics is probably monks, we're starting to see a monastic influence on the divine office. And this is only going to grow from this point on. Egeria continues, as soon as dawn comes, they start the morning hymns, and the bishop with his clergy come in procession. Again at midday, everyone comes into the anastasis, and says prayers and antiphons. At three o'clock, once more, uh, they do what they did at midday. At four o'clock, they have lunchnikon, which is Greek for uh, lucernarium that we talked about, the lighting of the lamps. And those prayers continue from four o'clock till dusk. Egeria also mentioned a delightful detail, I think. She tells how the many children present spontaneously cry Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, in answer to the deacon's reading of commemorations. The commemorations would be people who had died that they wanted to remember, I assume. So it's just a delightful idea to think that all these kids were there also. And as the deacon would say the name of someone who has died, they'd all yell out, Kyrie eleison. <laughs> they may not have known what they were saying or why, but they apparently enjoyed it. Certain, certain psalms are becoming associated with certain times. For morning prayer, the community usually recites Psalm 62 or 63 in the Hebrew uh, numbering. Also Psalms 148 to 150. For the evening service, they usually use Psalms 116 and 129 and 141, or in the Hebrew numbering, 117, 130, and 142. From this point on, let's say 450 on, the divine office becomes more and more monastic. Monasticism um, is usually dated to 271 AD, 
That's when a fellow named Antony or Anthony went off into the Egyptian desert and established a hermit type of monasticism. Each individual man lived by himself in his own cave. They would get together on Sundays for worship or whatever, but generally speaking, they were hermits. It was in 318 that another in, uh, individual who had gone to the Egyptian desert, whose name was Pacomius, was approached by some of the hermits, and they said, we want to share our lives more than we're allowed to do under Antony's uh, system. And so Pacomius established monasticism the way we normally think of it. It's called Cenobitic because C-O-E-N is Greek for cell. You know, like the cells in your skin are kind of lined up like prison cells. And so that was the idea. Each monk will have his own cell within a common building and will share meals and so on. Now, uh, monasticism spread like wildfire after its establishment, Eremitic in 271, Cenobitic in 318, uh, more so in the East than in the West, but either way, pretty soon monks started building monasteries that were attached to or very near to basilicas. And instead of, as in Nigeria, them coming and joining the laity, it became more and more the case that they came and did the readings instead of the laity. The uh, rubrics and the details of the divine office become increasingly complex under the monks because the monks see performance of the divine office as a primary duty of theirs, whereas it was an extension of the Eucharist for the typical lay Christian back then. St. Benedict, of course, is father of Western monasticism, as they say, in the same way that Basil the Great, I've heard him referred to on occasion around here, is known as the father of Eastern mysticism because he wrote a rule. Uh, here's what you do at set times of day. Here's when you pray. Here's what you pray. Benedict's rule, though, is far more famous. The rule of St. Benedict uh, he founded Monte Cassino in uh, 529, so his rule would have been sometime around then. He, as the tradition had done, continued to have the Psalter, the Book of Psalms, as the heart of the system of prayer that he created for his monks. But he also used hymns that were being sung in various basilicas in Italy at the time. And these are hymns that had been created in the last 200 years, 100 years, whatever. He also um, created short texts, antiphons, responsories, etc., and inserted them into the rule. So he was not just a traditionalist, but also, to some extent, an innovator. He insisted that his monks read the whole Psalter, all 150 psalms, every week. Uh, his, if, if you divide 150 by seven days, it comes out to 22 and a half psalms. Of course, some of the psalms are quite short. Some of the psalms are extremely long. So that's kind of an average, gives you an idea. And that's just the psalm readings. There's also other scripture readings from Old and New Testaments. There's also hagiographical passages, um, inspiring stories about martyrdom or the life of St. Benedict, or excuse me, the life of St. Anthony, or whatever. Now, 
we have been able to reconstruct, not just from the rule but from other sources, what the typical day was for a monk under uh, St. Benedict's rule during the great monastic centuries, which are roughly the 800s, 900s, 1000s, and 1100s. 2 a.m., you get up for the night office or vigils. After that, which took about an hour and a half, after that you had an hour's meditation of reading of scripture. At first light, when that darn rooster crows, you have lauds. At sunrise, you have prima. After prima, you have more meditation and reading until tersa. At 9 o'clock, you have tersa. From 9.15 until around noon, you go out and work in the fields. At noon, you have sext for about 15 minutes. The daytime hours have always been considerably shorter. From 12.15 to 4 p.m., you go back out to the fields and work. At 4.30, you gather for vespers. That takes about a half hour, and then around 5 o'clock, you have the single meal of the day. Meatless, by the way. We're not allowed to have it. Now that you're allowed 45 minutes for. At 5.45, you have Compline. And after Compline, you go to bed. <laughs> and then you get up at 2 o'clock AM the next morning, and this was your life. This was how it rotated. Here's a quotation from WHC Friend. It was a severe but not impossible regimen. And on a material level, it corresponded to the standard of life of an Italian peasant of the day. Gregory the Great, who was pope from 590 to 604, around 600, was a Benedictine. And consequently, he was interested in seeing the Benedictine service spread not only in the monasteries, but also in the cathedrals, to be said by the secular clergy. And the aspects of the monastic liturgy to be imposed as much as possible in all churches. Gradually, this comes to be the case. Um, throughout the 700s and 800s, monks are increasingly appointed bishops. And consequently, they too have an interest in seeing the advancement of this monasticization. Can I say that? This monasticization of the uh, divine office. Consequently, uh, up until the 800s, most clergy did not say the complete divine office every day. They had pastoral duties and so on. But with the monasticization, I like doing that. I'm going to continue. <laughs> with the monasticization of the divine office, it becomes required of all clergy, whether religious or secular, to say the divine office. And the laity virtually cease saying the divine office. It has become a duty of the teaching church, so to speak, and the learning church really doesn't participate anymore. They, they do it for us, so to speak. By the time you're in the 1000s, the 1200s, it's pretty well set, the divine office. And it, it is pretty much the, one, the office that had evolved in the monasteries. In the 1200s, um, the members of the curia 
found that they had so many administrative duties, they were finding it hard to do the full office. And so consequently, the Pope permitted them to have a somewhat simplified divine office. It was called the Office of the Papal Curia. Uh, Innocent III, around 1200, gave permission for this. And it was compiled into a handbook so that it could be carried around by hand. And the cardinals in the Curia could say the office as they could snatch time to do so throughout the day. Well, the Franciscans, who are founded in 1209, latch on to this new technology, the handbook, because it's very handy for them. They are friars, not monks. They travel around. They lead active lives. And so this was a way for them to be able to carry it with them. The Dominicans, uh, usually said to have been founded in 1216, although this Dominicans dispute that and say they were actually first, also latched on to this. And it became known as a breviary from like the word abbreviation, a, a, excuse me, a compilation of the divine office. So this becomes the, the priest's prayer book in the minds of everybody. What about the laity? They're not going to be saying this rather immense uh, burden of saying the entire divine office every day. What was developed for them instead was a prayer book known as a Book of Hours, if you've ha heard of a Book of Hours. The Book of Hours uh, basically substituted for what had been participation in morning's prayer and evening prayer. A typical Book of hour, Hours would contain a calendar of church feasts at the front, excerpts from the four Gospels, the Hours of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which was a lay version of an office that had been uh, created and inserted into the divine office for the clergy. It included the 15 gradual psalms, the seven penitential psalms, a litany of saints, an office of the dead, for the dead, excuse me, uh, the hours of the cross, and various other prayers. Some of these became beautifully illuminated, and they're mostly known nowadays for uh, being in museums as illustrations of miniatures done in the Middle Ages. The Council of Trent suggested a reform of the divine office might be nice. Paul V, immediately after the Council of Trent, Council of Trent was 1545 to 1562. In 1568, Pius V put out a, a revision, but it was barely revised, almost the same. And really, from 1500 to 1900, there's virtually no evolution of the divine office. What you get, though, right after 1900, is Pope St. Pius X. And Pope St. Pius X was very keen on liturgy. He put out a revised divine office. It was a simplification. It was not in any way uh, geared toward laity. It was still assumed by everybody that the divine office is purely a clerical duty. But Pius X's revised breviary inspired a Benedictine in Belgium. This Benedictine's name was Lambert Baudouin. He was a monk in Louvain, and he caught on to the vision that Pius X was starting to espouse. He, he, want, he translated the Roman Missal so that people could follow 
what was going on and participate, not just be passive spectators. He wanted to reestablish Vespers and Compline on Sundays and to give these services a place second only to that of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Well, from uh, Dom Lambert Baudouin's uh, beginnings, and he started up a uh, publication to promote his ideas, Benedictines in Germany and in Austria caught on to this is nowadays referred to as the modern liturgical movement. This movement, and what the advantage to there was that in monasteries like, like Maria Lach, you had historians like Dom Odo Cassels or like Romano Gardini, who was not a Benedictine but was a German priest, despite his Italian sounding name, and these actually went back and examined what happened in the early church in those earliest developments of the divine office. And lo and behold, they discovered the cathedral office. That was that early office where laity would come before they go to work and have a morning service with the clergy and then go to work, come back in the evening. They would all be together for what later was called Vespers. So now there existed historical justification for reforming the breviary in a really significant way in order to make it not just available to clergy, but also something that the laity could participate in. Pius XII promoted the modern liturgical movement cautiously, but he did do so the first encyclical ever to be uh, promulgated that dealt solely with liturgy was his encyclical Mediator Dei in 1947. And in it, uh, he um, endorses some of these ideas of the modern liturgical movement. The Pope speaks specifically about the divine office as the prayer of the mystical body of Christ. It ought to be a prayer rising from the entire church, not from a designated small segment of it. Well, Pius XII dies, and who becomes Pope after him? John the 23rd, who, in preparation for Vatican II, establishes a new liturgical commission to examine how ought we to revise Roman Rite liturgy. Um, because of the investigations and work that had been done, from 1900 to Vatican II, 1962 to 65, this commission already had a lot of its work done for it. And consequently, they were ready before any of the other commissions were. And consequently, the very first document to be promulgated by Vatican II was Sacrosanctum Concilium. First time that an ecumenical council had ever addressed liturgy at, before anything else. There were reforms that had to do with the liturgy uh, other than the divine office. For example, permission for the reception of communion under both species, concelebration, uh, use of the vernacular. But chapter four of that document deals specifically with the divine office. And I simply want to read to you chapter 4. And I'm going to leave out certain passages to save time. But I think this is a remarkable passage. See what you think. When the office is revised, these norms are to be observed. By the venerable tradition of the universal church, lauds as morning prayer, 
and Vespers as evening prayer are to be the two hinges on which the daily office turns. Hence, they are to be considered as the chief hours and are to be celebrated as such. You can see the influence of the historical research there, again, trying to get back to the early church. Uh, cathedral office rather than monastic office. Compline is to be drawn up so that it will be a suitable prayer for the end of the day. The hour known as matins, although it should retain the character of nocturnal praise when celebrated in choir, shall be adapted so that it may be recited at any hour of the day. It shall be made up of fewer psalms and longer readings. You'll notice on the chart, Matins is now called uh, office, office of readings. The hour of prima is to be suppressed. No more prima. In choir, the hours of Terza Sexta and Nona are to be observed, but outside choir, it will be lawful to select any one of the three according to the respective time of the day. So that it may really be possible in practice to observe the course of the hours, the Psalms are no longer to be distributed throughout one week, but through some longer period of time. In 1971, Paul VI approved a um, document which um, is called the General Instruction on the Liturgy of the Hours. And there, um, for example, they renamed Matins to Office of Readings. And they also decided that the Psalm, the Book of Psalms would be spread throughout four weeks. That really doesn't come from Vatican II. Vatican II just said it needs to be longer than a week. But it was in 1971 under Paul VI that it was decided it should be once a month. Readings from sacred scripture shall be arranged so that the riches of God's word may be easily accessible in more abundant measure. Readings excerpted from the works of the fathers, doctors, and ecclesiastical writers shall be better selected. The accounts of martyrdom or the lives of the saints are to accord with the facts of history. To whatever extent may seem desirable, the hymns are to be restored to their original form. And whatever smacks of mythology or ill accords with Christian piety is to be removed or changed. Also, as occasion may arise, let other selections from the treasury of hymns be incorporated. Hmm, possibility of including more modern hymns there. That the day may be truly sanctified and that the hours themselves may be recited with spiritual advantage, it is best that each of them be prayed at a time which most closely corresponds with its true canonical time. No more of this shoving it all together into four hours at the end of the day as had become common to some extent in the Middle Ages. A liturgical service may be substituted for the divine office. If you have a morning mass, that can substitute. Since the divine office is the voice of the church, that is, of the whole mystical body publicly praising God. You can see the influence of Pius XII there. Those clerics who are not obligated to office in choir, especially priests who live together, are urged to pray at least some part of the divine office in common. It is, moreover, fitting that the office, both in choir and in common, be sung whenever possible. Pastors, now, they speak about the, the uh, laity. Pastors
masters of souls should see to it that the chief hours, especially vespers, are celebrated in common in church on Sundays and the more solemn feasts. And the laity, too, are encouraged to recite the divine office either with the priests or among themselves or even individually. The Latin language is to be retained by clerics, but in individual cases, the ordinary has the power of granting the use of a vernacular translation to those clerics for whom the use of Latin constitutes a grave obstacle to their praying the office properly. Uh, the version, however, must be one that is approved. So there you have it. Those are the reforms that were instituted by Vatican II. That document appeared in 1963. The Liturgical Commission, international uh, group of liturgical specialists, best in the world, worked under those guidelines in the, for the succeeding years. In 1971, um, Pius VI, or excuse me, Paul VI promulgates their general instruction on the Liturgy of the Hours. Translations are underway. The International um, Commission on English and the Liturgy, for example, translates the divine office into English. So that in 1976, the official English version appears. There had been an unofficial French version that appeared in 1969. I don't have many details on it. I suspect it was unauthorized. And it got translated into English. It was called Christian Prayer. It's a one volume uh, version. But the official version looks like this. Liturgy of the Hours. That's what we called our American translation. In Britain, they translated it and called it divine office. The Liturgy of the Hours has seven hours, three major and four minor. The Invitatory is not an hour. It's simply the introduction to the first hour. But sometimes people do the office of readings at the beginning of the day, in which case the Invitatory would be preparatory for that. Other people don't do the office of readings at that time, some other time of day. And in that case, it would be um, introduction to the morning prayer. These are the official names now. Office of readings, morning prayer, daytime prayer, of which there are three, mid-morning, mid-day, mid-afternoon. You can tell what those are, right? That's the old Tersa, Sext, and Nona, 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. Evening prayer, formerly Vespers, and night prayer, Compline. So the three major hours are office of readings, morning prayer, and evening prayer. Canon law requires priests to pray the entire liturgy of the hours every day. It requires deacons to pray the morning and evening hours. It requires religious to obey their community's rules and constitutions, hence practice differs somewhat. Is it not true that Dominicans have a special um, office that differs somewhat from what everybody else does? Uh, some laity recite portions of the Liturgy of the Hours, perhaps morning and evening prayers. Here is the format for the Office of Readings. This is what you would find if you dig into the, the books that I'm passing around. You start with a hymn. You have one or two long psalms divided into three parts. You have a long passage from scripture, usually arranged so that in any one week, all the readings come from the same text. You have a long passage. It might be a hagiographical passage like a saint's martyrdom, it might be a theological treatise commenting on some aspect of the scriptural reading. It might be a passage from the documents of the Second Vatican Council. On nights before Sundays or feast days, the office of readings may become a vigil by inserting three Old Testament canticles 
and a reading from the Gospels. On solemnities, feasts, and Sundays outside of Lent, you have the hymn Te Deum, a concluding prayer, and a short concluding verse. Morning prayer, now you can see from that that it's intended to provide food for thought. It's, in, it's to deepen one's understanding. Morning prayer format is the same as evening prayer, except that morning prayer includes a scriptural canticle from the Old Testament. See that in the second line? You have a hymn, you have two psalms, you have one long psalm divided into two parts. Then you have a scriptural canticle from the Old Testament, whereas evening prayer has a canticle from the New Testament. You have a short passage from scripture, a responsory, typically a scripture verse, sometimes liturgical poetry. You say the canticle of Zechariah, known as the Benedictus, Luke 1, 67 to 79, intercessions, Lord's Prayer, concluding prayer, priest or deacon's blessing, if one is present, in a group without clergy or an individual recitation, a short conclusion. You'll notice evening prayer is the very same format, except as I mentioned, the scriptural canticle in line two is from the New Testament. And also instead of the Benedictus, uh, Canticle of Zechariah, you have Canticle of Mary, Magnificat. The minor hours each have their own formats as well, but they're quite short. Daytime hours format. They're like a compact office of readings. You have a hymn, three short psalms, or three pieces of longer psalms, a very short passage of scripture, then a responsorial verse, a concluding prayer, a short concluding verse. And that's the format for uh, midday prayer, excuse me, mid-morning prayer, midday prayer, and mid-afternoon prayer. Night prayer, formerly Compline, was given some emphasis by Vatican II. And so, although it's not considered one of the major hours, it is given uh, he sig significant heft. You have an examination of conscience, that is you reflect upon your actions during the day, a hymn, a psalm or two short psalms or simply Psalm 91, a short reading from scripture, the response be into your hands, Lord, the canticle of Simeon, known as the Nunc Dimittis from the Gospel of Luke, framed by the antiphon, protect us, Lord. You have a concluding prayer, a short concluding blessing, a hymn to Mary, Mother of Jesus. The basic four-week cycle of ours prays nearly all of the Psalms. Not all. Some are left out. In all offices, antiphons frame Psalms and canticles. Antiphons are brief kind of introduction, conclusion, comments. All offices conclude with the traditional Catholic doxology. The church provides two alternate collections in addition to that framework, which is permanent. The church also provides two alternate collections of psalms, readings, canticles, hymns, and antiphons for specific dates in the liturgical calendar. One collection of alternate selections is the proper of seasons for days in Advent, Christmas, Lent, and Easter. The other is the proper of saints for saints' feast days. Well, that's the state of the divine office uh, on March 10th, 2010. <laughs> Will it continue to evolve? I suspect so. I think we've made a darned good beginning at making the divine office available to the entire church. And I would love to see it become more and more shared by all Christians everywhere. I think, though, 
just to make a personal observation, it will probably have to be somewhat more simplified yet in order to become uh, widely adopted by the, by the laity. But I hope that happens. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. I have two questions. Um, not sure if I should ask them both or, okay. Um, one is with regard to vigils. I know that um, within the Benedictine office, there's this division between uh, like three different nocturnes. And also I know that the Carthusians, I don't know if they still do this, but they actually had three different times where they would, where they would rise. And I'm wondering if you know anything about the, uh, the, the w whether that arose first or whether like the midnight office arose first and what sort of the relation between those two different forms of night office was. And then um, my other question is that it basically concerns the time of prime. You know, I'm wondering when is the first hour actually begin? So uh, Yam in Yam Luci Sorto Sidere, uh, I mean, it has the peculiar character that it can mean either now, um, soon, already, you know, and so it's not entirely clear to me that it actually begins at sunrise or whether instead it might be something that's closer to, say, dawn. You know, um, also, I'm thinking about uh, where it says, uh, arise, O Christ, uh, and help us, you know, thinking about the way that the that sort of sunlight was viewed as something like a, a, a sacramental with regard to um, the rising of Christ, you know, and yeah. I'm wondering about, and, and so to me, I'm thinking that that doesn't make sense if the sun is already risen, you know, as, a, as an invocation, you know, given that imagery. And I'm wondering if you know anything about this or if you have any, um, yeah, these are sort of just, yeah, anything? Yeah. Thank you for your first question can be very simply answered. I don't know. <laughs> your second question, however, about Prima. Um, my understanding is, and you can, there's the, uh, the longer passage here has to do with astronomical time and that sort of thing. It talks about how um, when, the, when the light of the sun has, has come up the underlying curve of the earth to such a degree that its, its light is barely tempting uh, the upper atmosphere. That's when the roosters go nuts. That's the beginning of dawn. And dawn doesn't really end until the, the edge of the sun becomes visible at the edge of the horizon. That's my understanding. Let's see. Uh, morning twilight, a time of increasing light, is called dawn. The source of this light is the sun shining on the atmosphere above the observer. Twilight is a time of very slowly changing sky illumination with no abrupt variations. So um, I don't know exactly how long dawn typically takes. But it's my, uh, under, and you can see on the chart there, my understanding is that Lauds is at cock crow, which would be that barely tinting of light, whereas Prima is sunrise, which would be, well, how long does it take? Really? That's quick? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so that's all I know about it. As far as I know, Prima is when the upper barest bit of the sun is, becomes visible. Um, anyone else? Uh, two yes. quick questions. Uh, some scholars might say that uh, Islam is somewhat of a plagiarism of the Old and New Testament. Um, ironically, ironically, as we all know, the, 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 the Quran does mandate that people pray five times a day. Do you think that, that that had anything to do with the Christian tradition, which already existed around 600? Um, 
second question is uh, Aquinas considered the sort of the virtue the most virtuous Christian life to be that of the monk and the bishop he skipped over the priest for some reason but do you think do you think his admiration of the mo life of a monk had anything to do with the fact that they did obey uh, they did observe uh, the the rule of Benedict and, and the hours uh, the first question is Islam Muhammad was born in Arabia in around 570 AD. And at the time, Arabians were polytheistic. They had a set of gods and goddesses. Tradition says that they had a, about 360 gods and goddesses. Nevertheless, we are absolutely certain that there were Jews living in Arabia at the time, and there were Christians living in Arabia at the time. Um, Muslims do not believe that what one finds in the Quran is influenced by Christianity and Judaism. If there are parallels, that's because the same God revealed all three. Um, Muhammad is the last of the prophets, the first of whom was Adam, and then you got 260,000 in between. So um, they would not agree with my non-Muslim assessment, which is I certainly believe that Christians and Jews influenced Muhammad. Uh, I can't, I have never come across any documents from Arabia in the 6th or 7th centuries, he died in 632, which, which prove that he adopted the uh, requirement that all Muslims pray five times a day from Christian usage. But it sure makes sense. I, I would be surprised if that were not the case but I don't believe it can be proven. Oh, second question was, oh, uh, I assume that, a, that Aquinas considers the contemplative life superior to the active. Is that a fair paraphrase? Okay. Uh, because of the Mary and Martha episode, she has chosen the better part. Um, I'm sure there's more to it than that, but uh, that's how I'm getting out of it. <laughs> uh, have you uh, published anything on this itself? Another written this up, for example, in any article, or anything like this. And the second question is having to do with the antiphons and the canticles. Um, of course, you talked about the antiphons, and of course, we have in mass the three antiphons. But can you talk about a little bit more about the insertion of antiphons? You know there purpose and a canical, especially what would constitute a canical? Yes. In answer to your first question, I have not published anything about this, nor will I ever. <laughs> I, I'm a scripture scholar. I did this because I was interested and because we decided to do liturgy as our topic this year. And I just wanted to find out about it. Um, but everything I'm saying is already out there and published. I, I'm, it's quite derivative. I will, however, recommend a book, if you're curious. It's by an individual named Dominic Scotto, S-C-O-T-T-O. -T -T and it's entitled, The Liturgy of the Hours, Its History and Its Importance as the Communal Prayer of the Church. I found that one to be especially helpful. Uh, Dominic Scotto, S-C-O-T-T-O, -T -T The Liturgy of the Hours, Its History and Its Importance as the Communal Prayer of the Church. Uh, second question was about antiphons. Uh, I wonder if some of the uh, additions, for example, an antiphon that frames a psalm. I wonder if some of them might not have arisen 
as ways of Christianizing the Psalms. Uh, obviously, you can read the Psalms as a non-believer in anything, as surely a literary document. You can read the Psalms as a Jew, or you can read the Psalms as a Christian. A Christian reading of the Psalms means that you're you're seeing them in the light of Christ, who came later. And it's not always immediately obvious how a psalm, what it's got to do with Jesus or being a Christian. Because after all, these were all written by Jews. So I wonder if, to some extent, all of the uh, small portions that have entered into the divine office might not have arisen in part in order to provide some interpretation, some way of helping those who are reciting the divine office to see how the nucleus of the office uh, can be understood in a Christian context. That's a hypothesis. I don't have any proof. But sounds good to me. Oh, cantus is Latin for song. So a can canticle is just another word for song. Um, there are certain passages in scripture that are so obviously songs, the Psalms themselves, but also certain Old, pas Old Testament passages like the Song of Deborah in uh, Judges, um, or excuse me, uh, Exodus. The, uh, no, Song of Deborah is Judges. Um, Song of Miriam in Exodus. Um, Luke's gospel especially has six um, quite obviously poetical, lyrical passages. And those have been adopted and are, are traditionally called canticles. So I think that's what's meant there by, by that term. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate it.